2 Chronicles chapter 20, and we will start in verse 1. And this, this goes along with um, what I did uh, start on last Sunday morning. Um, we actually uh, continued that Sunday afternoon. So if you um, were not able to, to be here Sunday afternoon or were not able to watch the service, uh, it should be uploaded. Um, I'm calling, I called last Sunday morning sermon, The Trap or God's Trap. And this one really follows along the same line. And uh, there's going to be a lot of symbolism here. My goodness, it's 10 till and we haven't even started preaching yet. Um, so let's get right into it. Second Chronicles chapter 20. And uh, I want this to be a blessing to you. In verse 1, read along with me. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab. And let's take a minute just to remember who the, Moab, who the Moabites are. Who are the Moabites? Anybody remember? Who are they? Huh? They were enemies, yes, but where did they derive from? Lot. They were the incestuous offspring of a drunken man and his first daughter. Uh, that's where they came from. His daughters decided that they were never going to meet a man up there on that mountain. And so they took it in their own hands. This, let, me, let me say this to you. This is what living in Sodom will do to you. This is why most of the people in California think alike. Because you, the longer you live in California, the more you become like California people. And I saw a deal the other day uh, on the news, the businesses of San Francisco, California, the restaurant districts, they all sent a letter to the city mayor and the city council saying, unless you do something about these hundreds of homeless people that are defecating all over our front doorsteps and nobody's wanting to come into our restaurants and eat, unless you do something about it, we're going to stop paying our taxes to this city. We refuse to do it. And if that doesn't work, we're going to shut our businesses down. And then there can just be this giant hole in the middle of your pretty town that's just full of homeless people and nothing else. Because everybody in San Francisco has been more concerned about putting dem liberal Democrats in their city offices than they have been anything else in the world. And that's what it costs. And they mention New York City's the same way. They mention Chicago's the same way. They mention Denver, Colorado. And I was there and I'm telling you, they're not lying. We had to walk through a minefield of human waste to get through what should have, what was designed to be the city square where all the tourists and all the convention traffic and all the downtown business traffic was to be. They're supposed to walk around on these pretty sidewalks and go in these nice stores and go in these great restaurants. And you had to wade through human waste to get through it. And the city, liberal Democrats do nothing. That's what happens when you live in Sodom that long. Maybe it's, and I don't, there's a lot of applications with that, but maybe your problem is you've been living in Sodom too long. Maybe it's time for you to leave. Amen? But that's what, that's what happened. That's where Moab came from, and that's where Ammon came from. Ammon came from the other sister. That one sister said, you get him drunk tonight, sleep with him. I'll get him drunk tomorrow night, sleep with him. We'll have children. And one child was named Moab, the other child was named Ammon. And you have the Moabites and the Ammonites, children of incest. And then it mentions with them other beside the Ammonites. We're going to find out in a little bit that that's Edom. That's Esau's offspring. 
rejected by God. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Now I want you to understand this number and these three armies and what they represent and why did God, listen to this now, this is important. Why did God even allow them to even try to come against God's people? Why, did God, why didn't God just move in their hearts and cause them to stay away from Jerusalem? He could have done that, you know. That's how powerful our God is. Our God can put it in the minds. Did you know that God could change every mind in America right now if he wanted to? Why hasn't he? Maybe it's time to learn that. And with them other beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat saying, There cometh, underline the phrase, great multitude. Against thee from beyond the sea on this side, Syria. Behold, they be in Hazes on Tamar, which is in Enjedi. And Jehoshaphat feared. I want you to underline that. I want you to focus on this story. I'm not just reading words to you. These are words that I want you to focus on. I want you to think about them. I want you to meditate on these things. And after this, after this service today... Go home and read this again. When it's posted online, go home and listen to it again. I don't know if you've done that. But there are messages that I've heard preached over the years. I've got copies of them. You know what? I'll go back and listen to them again. They have had such a profound impact on my life. And I, there were things in there that I often forget that I need to be reminded of. And I will go back and listen to them. We, God has given us the ability to take everything that happens in this place. And it, again, I'm not saying anything about me. I'm giving you the word of God. But I'm focusing on certain things that it's saying because it's relevant. And I want you to remember these things because you might say, I don't need this today. But I guarantee you, by the end of September 2022, you will need this. Guarantee it. So, Jehoshaphat feared. Why did he fear? Because he knew three great armies against one they were going to die. Suppose that Russia, China, and all of the Middle Eastern nations decided that they were going to wage war, not over there in Russia, but right here in the streets of the United States of America. Y'all seen that movie, um, War Ga what is that? Huh? Red Dawn. Red Dawn. <coughs> they were fighting the fight in their own towns, in their own villages. We haven't seen that. We, we wouldn't know what to do. But if China decided to send... 400 million, I don't know how many do they have, 400 million soldiers, Russia joined in, they were going to send all of their soldiers, and then all of the Middle Eastern nations, along with all of the Middle Eastern Islamists who are already here, who have a right to keep and bear arms just like you do, or maybe they don't have right, but they've got them anyway, and they decided to wage war in this country, you're going to die more than likely. Do you think then it would be time for President Joe Biden to pray about something? Nancy Pelosi? Pelosi? 
That's why Jehoshaphat feared. And notice this next thing he did. And he set himself to seek the Lord. You're going to find out what these three armies are in a minute. Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Father, just add your blessings to your word. Help me to say what's right. Open up our eyes. Help somebody today. Father, please help somebody today. The way you've helped me. The way you've helped others. Help somebody today. I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Why did Jehoshaphat fear? Why, what was it that got him to set himself to seek the Lord? What was it that where everybody decided to pray and fast? Why did they gather together like, oh, I don't know, church service? To ask help of the Lord. Why? We're going to find out on this blank page. Count with me. In fact, turn to this verse in your Bible. And I want you to get your pen out. I want you to underline these things. I've, I've mentioned this so many times before. And I always assume that, well, I've mentioned it a few times. Everybody knows it by now. And so I can't talk about it again. But I'm going to. That's a mistake that I make. Sometimes is I think, <laughs> yeah, it's a mistake I make that, that I think everybody listens to me all the time. <laughs> yeah. First John 2.16. In fact, I want to turn there because that was supposed to be more than that. If I'm right, if I remember right, maybe I'm, no, I, I'm, I'm wrong. Just 1 John 2, 16, that's all I want. For all that is in the world. And see, it starts out with, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in, the, now, let's stop here for a minute. The Ammonites, the Moabites, and we're going to find out later that the Edomites are coming to destroy Jerusalem. Do you think if we offered them candy, they would change their mind? China, Russia, all the Middle Eastern nations, Pakistan, India. India has nuclear weapons. If they all decided to wage war, they, to, and they're not going to nuke us, because nuking America is not what they want. They want our resources. They want our land to nuke it, would waste it. What they want is the Americans out of the way of the riches that are in America. And America's still got a ton of riches. So if we have a ton of riches, why then are we buying all of our stupid stuff from China, Middle East, Pakistan? Makes you think, doesn't it? So do you think offering China, Russia, the Middle East some candy and whatever that they would like us and then they wouldn't hate us anymore and they, they would stop, they wouldn't wage war against us? Is that going to work? Robert, is that going to work? Don't love the world because the world doesn't love you. And if you think that if you just start loving the world, that automatically the world's going to like you, you are making a terrible mistake. A mistake that I have made and a mistake that I've watched other people make. 
All that is in the world, let's count the lust of the flesh, underline that. The lust of the eyes, underline that. The pride of life, underline that. How many fingers have I, George, how many fingers have I got up here? Three. So you've got eyes, right? Which means, here's what I know about George. Jim, you see these? How many have I got? You can see them? Glasses on, right? So George, Jim, Joe, you see them? Three fingers, right? Five. So you can see. Three men in a line, they're all wearing glasses. But here's one thing I know about all three of them. Lust of the eyes. Guarantee you. I'll pay them 50 bucks if I'm wrong. But I'm not wrong. Because I got glasses. And I have lust of the eyes. Okay? And, and it's, not just, it's not just naked women either. There's an RV show this Friday. Now, I hadn't brought it up to my wife yet. That's lust of the eyes. And then you know what buying it is? Pride of life. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. You're guilty. Period. The end. You are guilty of lust of the flesh. You are guilty of the lust of the eyes. And you are guilty of the pride of life. You are guilty. All three of those great... Uh, wait a minute. Are there more saved people in the world than sinners? No. There's more sinners in the world than there are saved people. There is a great multitude against us. And they want us dead. They want us gone. So you have against you the Moabites, the Edomites, the Ammonites, you had them against you. You have all of these three armies. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And you know what? Jehoshaphat figured out all by himself. I cannot fight these armies. I will lose and I will die. Somebody say amen. Do you get what I'm saying? That you were born into a world and into a body that has already dominated by lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, and they are killing you. And they will continue to kill you. For by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin, the Bible says. Jehoshaphat realized, hopefully, what many or most or hopefully all of you have realized. Is that you had a body, a flesh, full of lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. You tried everything in the world to stop, didn't you, Roy? Self-help books. Self-help seminars, going to, to churches where they just give you life coach nonsense. What I'm trying to tell you is, you cannot win that battle. Those of you addicted to drugs or alcohol, you cannot win. No one who has ever been on drugs says, I, I, I keep control of my drug problem. Nobody says that. Nobody who drinks says, I've got, I've got my drink under control. You're losing the battle and, and they're going to kill you. Jehoshaphat realized that. And you ought to be as, at least as smart as Jehoshaphat and realize that you're fighting a battle that you cannot win. And it is going to kill you and you're going to die and stand before God in judgment. 
Eve. What did she see? Same three things. When, he, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and tree desired to make one wise, pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, gave also unto her husband with her and did eat. Now, I, I'm, I'm just going to go through the congregation. And I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you think you would have done differently in the garden on that day than Eve or Adam did. Raise your hand if you think you would have got it right. You wouldn't have. You know how I know? Because you already have failed. You already failed. You're sitting in this church house today. I'm standing up here telling you I failed a long time ago. It didn't take me long at all to fail the test of lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. They conquered me years ago. You would have to be Jesus. Now I had, in my original notes, I had these things all nicely laid out where we could read them fast. Okay? But I had to hurry, so I just put it on there. But here's Jesus. He's in the wilderness. He's fasted 40 days. The devil, verse 3, the tempter came to him and said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. And he answered, Lust of the flesh... Lust of the flesh. And what did Jesus say? Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Did Jesus pass the first test? Then the devil taketh up him into a holy city, setteth up in the pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands thou shalt bear thee up, lest any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Pride of life. Tempting God. Jesus said, Then it was written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the, did he pass the second test? Again, the devil taking them up to an exceeding high mountain and showed them all the kingdoms of the world. Lust of the eyes. All the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto them, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Well, that sounds pretty good. I think I'll do that one. Is that what he said? Get thee, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him, alone, him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Third test. Lust of the eyes. Did he pass? He was offered more than you in this life will ever be offered. I mean, I, I, Brian, I love you. I just don't see the United Nations offering you the job of king of the world. I don't see it happening. So the devil offered Jesus more than any of us would ever get offered, right? Here's what I'm saying by this. We settled for a whole lot less. And still failed that test, didn't we? James 1. That's what I want you to turn to. Whole, I want you to turn to the whole thing there, James 1. And again, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back while you're turning there and, and ask this question. Why didn't God just stop the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Edomites from even launching this war, from even trying? Why didn't God just, why didn't they say, you know what, let's go to war? And somebody else said, why don't we drink beer instead? 
okay. And they all just sat and drank beer and got drunk. Why didn't, why didn't God stop the war before it ever started? Well, I'll tell you why. God is always testing who is and who isn't. You understand what I mean by that? He's always constantly putting our faith on trial. The enemies are already there. And we've already figured out they've already won the war. That's what Jehoshaphat did. He already, he, he, he did the math and it was simple math. And just a few seconds, he said to himself, we're fixing to die. We're not getting out of this, people. Do you remember the day you got saved? That day was the day you did the exact same math. Sin equals hell. It's an equation, isn't it? And is it balanced? Sure it is. For the wages of sin is death. That's a balanced equation. You did the math and you said, I'm going to hell. And if something doesn't change, that equation is going to reach its summation and I'm going to hell, and I don't want to go to hell. So what you did was the same thing Jehoshaphat did. You did the math and said, I can't beat, I can't even beat one of the armies. Let, let me talk about that for a minute. What if I said, what if I looked at, uh, who I, if I looked at Matthew here? I hadn't picked on Matthew yet. What if I said, Matthew's my son, and boy, he's a good one. Man, I ain't never, I ain't never had a child like him. And I said, boy, I know him. I, I know he's, he's never lusted after anything in his life. He's never, never looked on anything bad. He's never done anything like that at all. Does he still have something in him? What does he have left? If it's not lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh, what does he have left? Pride. Let me let you in on a little secret. I'd much rather deal with lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes than I would pride. Because pride makes you think that because you don't have the other two, you are better than everybody else. And that you can take on one of those armies all by yourself. And what does God say about the proud? God resists the proud. So is Matthew going to hell? The equation's still equal, isn't it? Sin, it doesn't matter what form it's in, equals hell. So James 1.13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man, every man is tempted. And, and excuse me for using this offensive language when I say the word man. Because believe it or not, the NIV has taken that out and replaced it with person. So as not to offend anybody. But let every man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Whose lust? 
Yours. Your own lust. You can't blame it on anybody else except you. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth. There's my equation. Am I right? See, it's simple, simple math. Two equals two. See how simple that is? Two quarters, five dimes. What have I got? 50 cents on each side, right? The math is the same. I don't care what it looks like. The math is the same for you. You've already lost the battle. So back in Second Chronicles, turn there, hurry. It ain't my fault we took all morning singing. But it's good singing, wasn't it? Second Chronicles chapter 20, back in verse 5. Joshphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in the, do you think, hey, is God in charge of the Edomites? Is he in charge of the Ammonites? Is he in charge of the Moabites? Sure he is. And he's the one that said, hey boys, come down here to Jerusalem. And they thought they was going to go in in Jerusalem and take over the town. God just had a different plan. And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might so that none is with able to withstand thee? Listen, I want to tell you the day that God got a hold of your heart and he said, I'm going to save you, you filthy rascal. You couldn't have denied it if you wanted to. Amen. God got a hold of you and he was going to wring you dry until you repented. Art not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel and gavest it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever and, thy, and they dwelt therein and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name saying if when evil cometh upon us as the sword, judgment or pestilence or famine we stand before this house and in thy presence for thy name is in this house and cry unto thee in our affliction then wilt thou hear and help who remembers the day you got saved and tears came down your eyes? Who remembers that day? Raise your hand. I was nine years old. I was crying like a little nine-year-old. Wasn't I, Mama? Mama, can I get saved? She was crying more than me. But I cried unto the Lord. You know why? I knew I'd already done it. I'd already stole the candy bars. I'd already lied to my mom and dad. I'd already sneaked a peek at a dirty magazine. I had already snuck a sip of daddy's Mogan David. I'd already done those things. I was going to hell and I knew it. Wilt thou hear and help? And now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir. Now he names the third one, Mount Seir, Edom. Whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession. See, that's what sin does. Sin will keep you out of God's possession, which is heaven. Is it not heaven? Is it is the heaven not belong to God? That's where we're spawn to sin is what keeps you out. I've got somebody on my heart. I want you to pray for him, and I am not going to tell you who it is.
but they have sin in their heart. And it will keep them out of heaven. And I am grieving. I am grieving. Now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest already read that. O God, verse 12, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Underline that. That's your sin. So tell me, excuse me, tell me, how, you're going, how, how are you going to stop lusting? How are you going to stop doing that? Are you going to pluck your eyes out? You should read a book <clears throat> called uh, 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chinnaquy. Or maybe it's the priest, woman, and confessional. But in one of those, it, Charles Chinnaquy was a Catholic priest out of Quebec. Ended up in Illinois for a while, back in the 1800, back in the time of Lincoln. And Chinnaquy grew up in a town, a Catholic town up in French Canada, where one day he saw the parish priest running out in the street and crying in pain. And he collapsed, bleeding everywhere. And when the people of the town came rushing to him to find out what had happened, they thought maybe somebody had attacked him, robbed him or whatever, and they were going to exact vengeance on the, whoever robbed the man of God. They found out that this priest emasculated himself because he couldn't stop lusting. And his church told him that as a priest, that once he took the vow of celibacy, he would no longer have the desires that he had. And Chris, that man lived as a priest for years and struggled with his own lust. Being told by that evil, popish, hellish doctrine that as a priest, he shouldn't have that any longer. And realized one day that the only way maybe to stop that was to take a knife to himself and cut everything off. He nearly bled to death. You don't, you can't stop. Don't tell me you can. For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives and their children. See, this message for all of us adults is for us, for our children's sake. Do you want to see your children grow up in this world where the pedophiles are now running the schools, the daycares, the public offices? They're everywhere. Do you want to see your children grow up and be turned into a pervert before they're even 14 years old? Is that what you want? Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives and their children. They said, we're going to lose them all. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came with the spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, hearken ye all Judah, ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. And thou, King Jehoshaphat, Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed, by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. When did he fight it? The cross. Did he win? You better believe he won. He won. See, the battle isn't even yours to fight. 
because you can't you can't you're telling it you're telling your eyes not to ever look at a woman a man a house a new car not to ever watch commercials on television not to go to Walmart anymore and just run in grab what you want and leave you can't even do that much less anything else the battle isn't yours it belongs to God and God already fought the battle and won Amen Amen thank you Jesus Somebody's going to shout. Tomorrow. You know what your job is? Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed. He's prepared for us a place. When we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. I told you there's going to be singing here. Tomorrow, go you down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz. And you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jagreel. See, God already knew their hiding place. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Don't bring no swords. Don't bring no bows and arrows. Keep your AR-14 at home. He said, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves and stand ye still. And see the salvation of the Lord with you. O oh, Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord and the Levites and the children of the Kohathites. The Kohathites were the choir members. And of the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Bow your heads. Please, you come down here. Just, well, I don't know how to do it. Some of y'all need to, there's probably somebody here this morning that just needs to come down. And remember before God that it's not their battle. It's God's. Even their own sin is not their battle. The battle is God's. And so while she plays, all I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you one time, one time only. If God has dealt with you this morning and you'd like to come down and say, God, fight my battle for me. Because I'm fighting and I'm, I'm losing. I'm doing a lousy job. I'm not winning. I'm not winning. I'm just asking one time, that's it. You folks online, get down on your couch, there on your bed, your computer desk, get down on your knees. Pull your car over. Put your face down before the Lord. And say, God, I am fighting a battle. I'm losing. And God, I, I'm tired of losing. I'm tired. See, if you, play, if you play a guy at chess or checkers, 
a hundred times and he beat you a hundred times, you don't play him one more time. You give up. And what I don't want and what I've already seen this week is somebody give up. They gave up. And I've been grieving over that. And I don't want to see you give up by thinking that you can fight this. Best thing I ever did in my life was turn everything over to Jesus Christ. And there is one reason only why I'm standing here today. Because I realized I could not fight the battle. I wasn't winning. <laughs> Father, we come before you this morning, Lord. For all of those, Lord, who wherever they are today. Bowed before you in reverence and humility they've humbled themselves this morning before you because you are the mighty God and God those stupid sin habits that we picked up years ago God you could have stopped that before that ever showed up but you didn't It's because you wanted to show us that you'll always fight our battles. Always. And you'll always win. And while, and while every time we fail, the devil may jump and shout and have him a good time because he thinks he's got you now. Until he hears that sinner repent. And that is a, a sound that he just cannot deal with. So Father, may people all over the world this morning... At the name of Jesus, cry out unto the Lord and show them, Father, that the battle is not ours, but it's yours. Father, this battle that's going on in Kenya, it's not our battle, it's yours. Father, the battle that we are fighting in America, and we're losing. We are losing this battle. That battle's yours. This nation is yours. And Father, you will do with it what seemeth well unto you and what is right. Only, Father, we beg you, Watch over and save your people. Lord, just bless the words of this message this morning. Bless all of those, Lord, who come to you. Thanking you, Father, for fighting the battle that they've lost every single time. We praise you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said... Amen. Would you stand to your feet this morning?